This month's Where'd the Road Go is sponsored by four awesome people. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Indrid Cold, and 36 Dingo. If you want to become a patron, www.wheredtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And I have back Mr. Travis Watson. Every once in a while, I want to call you Travis Walton. Um, <laughs> Please don't do that. I've never been abducted by an alien. Sorry. <laughs> it's just I, Travis and then the W immediately, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've had people actually make that mistake online, you know, where they thought that I was that guy. And, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. You want to go talk to the dude who lives in Arizona? Sorry. Right. <laughs> now, I used to live in Arizona, which was, but that was before I got involved with, you know, with writing and uh, these, yeah. these books and stuff. So. But yeah, every once in a while, I, I get somebody who, who thinks that I'm that guy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm like, no, nope, nope, sorry. So uh, the name of this book, uh, which I do not have in front of me, is what? Canadian Monsters and Mysteries. Okay. I was right. And if I said it, I would have been wrong. Um, <laughs> so again, I said this last time you were on, I totally recommend this book. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, there's tons of interesting cases as well as, you know, I like the way that you take the stuff apart and throw out a bunch of different possibilities. Uh, and one of those things you did, uh, with sea monsters and you started talking about how the possibility of sea monsters being tulpas. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, so one of the things that I've always said is that if we are going to discover something that's completely unknown, a, a brand new animal, chances are good it's going to be in the deep sea. Yeah. So I don't for a minute um, deny the idea that there might actually be these physical sea creatures out there. Um, you know, whether it's a giant pinniped or a giant eel or, you know, whatever it happens to be. I, I you know, I, I'm not that up on my sea monster lore. Um, but you know, it occurs to me too that if you uh, if you look at the mythologies of the world, um, there are any number of giant serpents in the sea. You know, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of Jormungandr in the in the Norse mythology because that's the one that pops into my head. Mm. Um, but um, you know, and one of the things that that I think needs to be given more consideration in the paranormal realm is this idea that if you get a group of people together and direct give them a very clear image of something you know whatever that something might be and you have enough people focused on that image and there's emotion poured into that image in this case sometimes fear then it's entirely possible that you know that we're creating these thought forms that are manifesting to people who have some ability to see them and this could be uh, you know the case with lake monsters because again you have that uh, that same thing, you know, Ogopogo, for instance, there, there's that long, long history, starting with native people, uh, of, you know, there being the demon in the lake. I think they called it Naitaka, um, you know, and we talked about how it was, you know, swallowing people's horses and stuff. Back right, in the yeah. Um, but, you know, so there's there's that, that belief and there's that fear and there's a lot of people focused on it. And I think it's entirely possible that, uh, you know, that, that people may be seeing something that is that we have some co-created aspect to, um, you know, the, the classic thing, of course, is Alexandra uh, David Neal's uh, book on, on Tibet and, and her whole uh, creation of this little monk guy that followed her around for a while and then kind of went rogue. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that idea of thought forms, call them servitors, tulpas, is something that we find all throughout occult esoteric lore. And I think it's something we need to pay attention to. I mean, um, there have been a couple of, and this isn't in the book, this is just, you know, me spouting off, but, you know, there have been a couple of, of instances of uh, so-called hauntings where, you know, it, it appeared, uh, I can't remember his name, Walter Gibson, something like that. Um, 
guy that wrote for the radio show, The Shadow. Um, oh, yeah. Actually, there's there are reports that his house is haunted by a character that looks like the Shadow. Yeah, there was there was um, a plantation. Yeah. There was a plantation down south. Uh, I think David Weatherly mm-hmm. talked about it, where people repeatedly had seen this ghost that was supposed to be of like you know one of the slaves or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that this person never existed. But there were right. photo- there were photographs of the ghost that all looked pretty consistent. There were. Uh, you know, reports through through decades that were all pretty consistent. Mm-hmm. But when, you know, the story was checked into, it's like, oh, no one like that ever existed here. So where did that come right. from? Right. And, and, you know, you have the same kind of, of uh, situation in places like the LaLaurie Mansion in New Orleans, where there was a deep, uh, you know, incidence of abuse and so forth. But when I went there, um, my overall impression is that a lot of, while there is definitely a, call it a miasma that surrounds that place, um, you know, that I think is, is partially the result of the ill treatment of slaves and so forth that happened there. Uh, there's also, there's a psychic overlay there that is, you know, the imprint of the story as it's been told countless times um, yeah. by tour guides and whatever that is real, you know, to somebody with, you know, some sensitivity, it's real. Um, so, you know, so when we're talking about lake monsters, we're talking about uh, sea monsters, you know, one of the things that I point out too is that many of these creatures are seen in cold, still water, which is supposed to be in some uh, esoteric uh ideology supposed to be a a great um container for these thought forms uh it, it's it, they they adhere very well in that kind of a situation and you know I, as i pointed out I, I didn't run across any stories at all where uh one of these creatures appeared on a on a stormy day it, it seems that they're always flat glass-like water um, whenever these things are reported so yeah, I mean it's a thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm I, I'm I'm completely willing to accept that there might be unknown species in the ocean because we keep finding weird stuff in the ocean. Oh, I mean, certainly. they pulled the coelacanth out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, what in the fifties? Um, so there's no telling what's still down there. Um, you know, there there are authors who are making uh, making book on the whole uh, you know mosasaur thing and and writing these you know terrific sort of horror stories about sea monsters that you know are or, you know, relic dinosaurs. Could be. I, I There's no way that we can know for sure until somebody actually catches one. But um, again, as with Sasquatch, I think we, we really have to consider that uh, there's a certain subset of those stories that may be uh, thought forms uh, that have been created over the course of time, from mythology, from stories, you know, from 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 all of these sea stories, you know, yeah. people, oh yes, there was a serpent and it went by my boat. And, you know, and, and you know, those things become reality after a while. <laughs> uh, there was something about that. I was going to, Oh, uh, you know, you, you, we also have things like the Philip experiment where they literally created oh, yeah. a ghost. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, it's, and not only did they create a ghost, but the dang thing was able to physically I- interact with its environment. Yeah. Which, you know, <laughs> Because they got table tapping and and you know all that all that kind of stuff too you know classic uh, sort of physical mediumship things that uh, uh, you know that were so common in the spiritualist era yeah yeah <laughs> and it 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 seemed legit so you know mm-hmm. but I mean sure. that, that, that shouldn't really shock us I mean we have a lot more uh, I don't know energy out there that we that I think we're cognizant of. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's a lot well, more we can you know, do, um, but we just don't have control over it. Same way we don't have control yeah, of dreams and things like that. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, there and there are certain techniques that one can use for for helping to develop their recall and dreams and that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, for the most part, we're all you know. Even I mean, I know there are a bunch of people that uh, you know are into the to the magic thing and so forth, and and uh, I'm very interested in occult and esoteric lore and. And I've been part of groups and, and done some things in the past, but, you know, it's like for the most part, we really, you know, we like to think that we have a key to working with this stuff, but a lot of times it's just wild talent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah. I think it helps. I mean, it just say, say oh, yeah. that you yeah, can yeah. help remember your dreams. Magic can help you 
get in touch with those deeper parts of yourself that actually do control mm-hmm. reality, but we still don't have yeah, a one-on-one yeah. control of it. Yeah, you know, it's not like you can, uh, well, it's not Harry Potter. Yes. I'll, I'll just yeah, put it that way. Exactly. You, know, you can't just whip your wand out and make stuff happen. <laughs> yeah. And so, if you think that you can, then I want to see the video. Yeah, right. You know, it's like uh, it's like Linda Godfrey used to say. She she would uh, she would get these uh, letters, these rambling emails from people who claim that they could make the transformation to a werewolf and all this kind of stuff. And she said, "Well, okay, send me the video." Yeah. <laughs> you know? But nowadays, that would be so easy to fake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, you'd almost have to get. Uh, you know, like six scientists who were completely skeptical of the whole thing and, and put the guy and or per, woman in the in the middle of this person and affect the change. And even then, they'd probably find some way to, to, to deny it because it, it just goes completely against their whole yeah, you know, yeah. scientific materialist paradigm. Well, we didn't see a change, but he changed into a wolf. I didn't see that. No, no. It's, it's, <laughs> it's actually an optical illusion that's caused by uh, the sun getting in our eyes. Yeah, there we, them, go. Yeah. We're, we were moonstruck. <laughs> we, we, we were all having a mass hi, hi, uh, hallucination. Oh, it was a mass hallucination. That's right. Or, you know, he's using some sort of a nerve toxin that's producing this hallucinatory effect. You know? <laughs> so yeah. um, one of the things you deal with in the book that I was like, is one of the things I've never taken seriously, but the the accounts in your book are pretty interesting. Is that of mer people? Yeah. Now that was that. Now again, um, I'm a big fan of John Michael Greer's book, uh, uh, Monsters: A Field Investigator's Guide to Magical Beings, and he uh, has a whole section in that book uh, about mer mer people, mer folk. I guess we'll call them mer folk. Let's call them mer folk. Um, which he takes very seriously and ends with a warning that says, you know, if you see one of these creatures, they're beautiful. That's great. Stay at a distance. Don't bother them because they're also associated with storms. Mm. Um, and, you know, just general bad things happening to you if you mess with them. And lo and behold, while I was doing research for this book, um, Johanna Burton wrote a book called Strange Events, where she tells a story about a French explorer named uh, St. Germain. He and his uh, group were camped out along the shores of Lake Superior. This is in 1700 sometime. Um, and he actually sighted a mermaid uh, that, he decide- that he described as being kind of like a child, um, sort of woolly hair and so forth. Um, mermaid didn't seem particularly alarmed by them, but, uh, was, you know, looking at them with some unease. Right. Yeah. So they're watching this, this being creature being, I guess, um, for a while. And then for some bizarre reason, St. Germain decides that he wants to shoot this thing. You know, maybe it's the, the Western European desire to take trophies or something. I, I don't know, but. He pulls his rifle out and his native companion loses her mind. She goes after him and wrestles the rifle away from him. And she is so angry with him that she actually leaves the party. Yeah. Um, telling him that, you know, you know, he's a complete idiot wanting to harm. I, let's see. She called him the gods of the waters and the lakes. Um, and he's like, whatever. You know, yeah. he goes and takes his, he takes his group, you know, handy group of explorers off and sets up camp on the shore of the lake. And everything goes to hell in a hand in the basket that night. Um, the night is, is extremely cold. Um, everybody goes into their tents early, um, but they're not able to sleep because a violent gale blows up on, on the shore of the lake. Um, and you know, we're talking Lake Superior here. This is the lake that sunk the Edmund Fitzgerald. When they get storms, they get storms. Yeah. Uh, so, and, you know, having lived on one of the smaller Great Lakes, you know, I lived on Erie for, for 13 years and saw some humdinger storms coming off of that lake. So I can't imagine the, the big, deep, cold Lake Superior, the kinds of violent storms that they get there. But long story short, um, St. Germain and his, his men were forced to pull up camp and move to higher ground, or they were going to either A, drown, or lose all their supplies. Um, so they certainly uh, kind of learned their lesson about messing around with merfolk uh, that evening. Um, so that 
I, I thought that was a, an interesting segue into the whole mer people thing. But the other thing that I thought was really interesting is that some of the or most of the stories that I found for the book were actually from John Warm's uh, Strange Creatures Seldom Seen, uh, and they're from indigenous people. And the funny part about this is that uh, the indigenous folk that, that he interviewed invariably described uh, a being that was, you know, you know, the classic mermaid, kind of half fish and half person, but the person half was white mm. and, and, and tended to have like white, uh, like a uh, red or blonde hair. Um, I found several of these accounts in, in Warm's book and, and, uh, and I included a couple in the book. And in both cases, the, the one young lady uh, used to enjoy uh, diving into the water and, and she and her friends would compete to see who could, could swim underwater the longest. And she ran into one of these beings under the water in this lake that she was swimming in. And she said the thing that she remembered about it was its beautiful golden blonde hair. Yeah. And then, uh, th- and then there's another one where um, uh, there's a couple of people that are walking uh, – group of, of, of women who are walking along the shore of um, let's see Lake Winnipeg and um, you know they're walking and talking and they, they see they look off in the distance and they they see a white woman sitting on a rock which is not something that you would see in you know wilderness Canada uh, you know most of the people that live out there are indigenous folks and yeah. you know there's not much reason for a single white female to be sitting out on a rock in the middle of nowhere, right? Um, so they decided they were going to take a detour down the shore, and they took a path, and they lost sight of her for a little bit. And then they came up on this person, and this being was, you know, the fish-like bottom, but was a, a white female with red hair on the top. And as soon as uh, this being spotted them, it, it dove into the water and disappeared. Funny part about this story was that you know the 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 mer person mermaid I guess you would call it uh, was sitting calmly with its hands folded in its lap and I was wondering if you know you know mer beings actually meditate you yeah because it's what it sounded like you know um, so you know that to me was a really strange um, sort of juxtaposition of lore because you know the the indigenous folks here in in Canada. Obviously, have their stories of the little people and the fairy, and, and and or what we would call fairy, and so forth. Um, but mermaids? Where did mermaids come from? Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose it's possible that uh, you know that that you know the native people were exposed to mermaid stories um, from the European settlers, but. I, why would you? Why would they be seeing them, <laughs> right, in their lakes and so forth? You know, and why, particularly in this case back in the 1700s, you know, was this 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 native woman so adamant about uh, you know defending this creature? You know, it, yeah, it seems yeah. that there's something more to that story that we maybe just are not getting. Um, because, you know, it's sometimes difficult to, to pry these things loose from their moorings. And, and, and it feels like mermaids are kind of the fey folk of the water. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, to a certain extent, yeah. I mean, you have, um, you know, other, other fairy beings that are associated with things like, uh, is it the selkie, um, which is oh, yeah. a, a seal creature and, and things like that. But yeah, I mean, mermaids are mer, mer folk. Because there are mermen too, um, or certainly certainly seem to be a sort of a, a fairy derivative that that lives you know specifically in the water. But you know, it's just it's interesting to me that these indigenous folks would be seeing uh, you know a, a, a mer person that basically looked like the European invaders. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's weird. I mean, I guess, you know, initially when, when I hear the term mermaid, the first thing that comes to mind is that fake skeleton that they once tried to push oh, off yeah. as being a real mermaid. Yeah, but, and yeah, I mean, there's plenty of, you know, there's the whole scientific thing about, oh, well, people are seeing dugongs and manatees. It's like, I love that explanation. It's like, not only is it tripe because, you know, most people who can actually see more than five feet in their face would well, five feet in front of their face would never mistake a, a, you know, mermaid manatee or dugong for anything other than a manatee or dugong. If you've ever seen one of these creatures, they're ugly. 
<laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 They're, they're, they're not, they, they in no way resemble, uh, even when they're hovering on the surface with their heads out of the water, they in no way resemble a person, much less a attractive female person. You know? Right. So you right. got that. The other thing is that the vast majority of merfolk sightings are in cold northern waters, and a, mer, a manatee or dugong would survive up there. Mm. They just don't. I mean, they sometimes will migrate a, a little farther north in like Florida and, you know, the places where they normally hang out, but they just, they, they wouldn't make it in, in waters that cold. It just wouldn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> so... But, uh, but so then never, the never mind that. Say, well, they saw a walrus. You know? <laughs> yeah, never, never mind that. It's explained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've, we've, we've explained it. It's swamp gas. I mean, uh, mer, uh, dugongs. So right, animals, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's the next chapter. You have some really weird white humanoid encounters. Oh, and I've yeah. never heard of these. And the, uh, the, one of the ones that stood out uh, was originally on Phantoms and Monsters mm -hmm. uh, was the Legend Trippers. Yeah. Yeah, so these guys made the cardinal mistake of anybody who's going legend tripping and not listening to the legend. <laughs> you know, I mean, if your local indigenous people tell you that a certain place is not a place you want to go, then you should have one of two responses. One, don't go there. <laughs> two, if you do want to go there, then your next question to this individual would be, okay, well, I understand I'm not supposed to go. Is there anything that I can do to make it more acceptable? Right. You know, and sometimes there is, and sometimes there isn't. Yeah. And if there isn't, then don't go there. Um, I, I, I'm sure that I mentioned this in the last recording, but I've, I've been in, in, you know, the Superstition Mountain Range in Arizona, which is sacred ground to the Apache. It's the home of their Idnahin, who are the, the thunder beings. Um, and there are places in those mountains you do not want to go. I mean, I, I walked into a canyon once. Um, it's the desert. It's full daylight out. And I walked into a canyon once while I was out hiking and bushwhacking a little bit, which I shouldn't have been doing, but I was young and dumb. Um, and uh, as I walked into this place, I had uh, an experience of darkness. It didn't literally become dark, but it felt dark to me. And I was like, okay, you know, and, the, and, and you got that familiar sort of, uh, you know, hair standing up on the back of your neck feeling. Right. I was like, all right. So somebody doesn't want me to be here. I backed up about five steps and I was in the sunlight again. So I went another way, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's the people that ignore that, uh, that fear reaction that get themselves into trouble. <laughs> Right. You know, uh, and uh, so in this particular case, that's which is my long digression about, you know, legend tripping and so forth. Um, in this particular case, these guys were bored. Um, they'd gone out to this abandoned slaughterhouse that had a reputation for being cursed once before. And they decided they were going to go check it out again. Um, even though after their first visit, um, the guy said that, that, you know, the people in the group had random, you know, bad things happening to them. Yeah, you, know, you would think, okay, well, maybe that's not a place to go. No, let's go on board. Let's go back. You know? <laughs> so they get back to the location, which is again out in, you know, the middle of nowhere in the forest. You know, it's abandoned, it's it's run down, so forth and so on. It's a former slaughterhouse, which you know, to me would be creepy in and of itself just because of the amount of death that happened there. Yeah. So they get there and the wind is howling um, and they keep hearing this whistling sound. Um, but they just, you know, they're, they're like, okay, it's, it's the wind whistling through something in the building. Um, they're exploring, you know, they go exploring, they're tramping through some of the buildings, you know, they're, they're looking around, they're, you know, doing what urban explorer type people do. They're probably taking pictures or whatever. Um, one of the people in the group saw something moving um, outside of the main building. Um, so they all bailed out of the, the, the side building they were in and crawled through a fence. <laughs> so, okay, so let's add trespassing to right. the thing, right? 
and call, crawled through a fence to get to, to that main building. And as soon as they got through the fence, um, they heard a noise that sounded, it said, the, the quote is, it sounded like a rusty door was slowly opened and closed. And by this time, the, the witness, the guy who actually sent the report in, was ready to bail. He's, he's creeped out completely already. But the rest of the gang talks, talks him into staying. Um, you know, they go into the main building, they hear running footsteps. Um, and at that point, everybody's like, you know, there's something in the building with us. We're going to get the hell out of here. Right. So they all bail out and they're, they're running for their vehicle, <laughs> which was some distance away. <laughs> and as they were running, they, uh, were shining flashlights back down the path behind them and witnessed a quote, completely solid white bipedal humanoid running down the trail. Now, this is one of the things that really frustrates me about these stories sometimes. Um, you know, I, I want to go and, and find the witness sometimes and say, okay, what did you see? You know, because, of course, your Sasquatch researchers are going to say, oh, well, they saw a white Sasquatch. Right. You know, your, uh, your uh, UFO people are going to say, oh, well, they saw an alien. <laughs> you know, your, uh, your ghost people are going to say, oh, well, they saw a ghost and it was very solid. You know, it looked solid running down the trail. We don't know exactly what it was they saw, but it was a, apparently a fairly good sized, solid white bipedal humanoid running down the trail behind them. Um, and again, you know, a native friend of this guy had told him, don't go there. You know, right. This right. is not a place you want to go. You know, so I, I, and we know that um, there are all kinds of, of weird one off creatures that people run into, too. You know, yeah. all you have to do, I, this is from Phantoms and Monsters. All you have to do is read Lon's blog, and, you know, you're going to run across all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, but again, what did they see? What did it look like? You know, was this a tall, skinny being? Was it, right. you know, was it a big, massive thing like a Sasquatch? Was it, uh, you know, was it spooky looking and, and, you know, ghosty? Or was it just some kind of strange one-off creature that happened to be hanging out in this particular place at this particular time? Uh, you know, maybe came through, you know, one of those anomalies. Yeah. That we talked about. Yeah. I think you yeah, also didn't, just, didn't you also have a story where they saw it and it was long it was like tall and thin yeah yeah so there's another story um, this guy uh, was staying with family um, in a in a campsite so they they owned this property and there's apparently is a very large property and they were camped out there um, I guess they were in trailers it was kind of the, yeah yeah they were camping out in trailers. Um, so generally, uh, most of these, and I think they were doing some hunting. It seems like they were doing some hunting. Um, but in any event, uh, the, the, the witness said that there were, you know, big cats and bears and stuff in the area. So they very rarely went around unarmed. Um, this particular night though, of course, um, the witness is going from his mother's trailer to his own, um, and he's keeping a, an eagle eye out. You know, he's got his, his lantern that he's using for light, and he's, he's keeping a strong eye out because he doesn't have any weapons on him. Um, and he really regretted that <laughs> because uh, he got about, uh, I don't know, doesn't, doesn't really tell me how far he was in his progress, but he looks off to the side and about 20 feet away from him is this naked, extremely pale, almost gray, lanky humanoid figure um, that's standing stock still and, and watching him. Um, and of course, he has the terror reaction. <laughs> Right. Um, he sort of froze there for a few seconds. Um, he said that the creature was somewhere between six and a half and seven and a half feet tall, uh, slumped shoulders, a uh, very frail, thin body uh, that he describes as reminding him of photos from the Holocaust, mm. but with very long limbs. So you can sort of imagine a kind of a giant golem. You know, yeah. It's kind of what I picture when I'm, when I'm, uh, when I'm doing this thing. Well, he got over his, his freeze reaction and ran for his trailer, uh, bolts himself inside, you know, picks up his shotgun, and he sits there, you know, basically waiting for this thing to come get him until almost 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, he does finally go to sleep, but he still has got the shotgun. I think he probably slept with his shotgun, which probably isn't a great idea, but 
given the circumstances, yeah. I'll, I'll let it pass. Yeah, when you're scared like that, um, sure. Yeah, you know, so once he woke up, he went outside to see if, you know, he could find any any evidence of the creature. And of course, you know, as these stories always go, he found nothing. Yeah. But the description of this thing, you know, if we uh, extrapolate this to the other stories, which is entirely possible to do because they don't tell us much as far as what this thing, what, what these white humanoid things look like. The, the description of this thing is just like, holy crap. <laughs> I'm, I would want to run into the thing in, in, you know, in the forest with, without being heavily armed either. Yeah. Um, just, you know, it's not a, just doesn't strike you as being a, a very friendly thing to run into. It's not, uh, there's, there's no way you can kind of cast this as a sweetness and light fairy thing or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And these you are know, the, and again. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, this, this is something I've never heard of before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, I, I've seen a couple of reports on Lon's website about these rake things that seem kind of similar, but, um, you know, it's just, you know, you read the description of this thing and it forms a very clear image in your mind of what, what, what you're talking about. Um, the other thing that popped into my mind, um, you know, because again, this is Canada, uh, is the Wendigo, because um, oh. they are alleged to be very tall and be very, you know, this creature is de- described as being so hungry that it's actually eating its lips all the time, you know. Um, now, modern day renditions and art of these creatures have for some reason put horns on them. Right. But that's not really how they're described in 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 the myths. Um, I don't know who came up with that idea, but you know, in any event, not a creature you want to run across. Even if you know, yeah, there's always the possibility that you know this is a young man. He's out late at night. It's kind of a sensory deprivation kind of thing because there's just the circle of light, so he doesn't have a lot of stimuli coming in. Could have had a psychic experience where he saw something from the other world. Sure. That, you know, that, uh, you know, scared the bejeebies out of him, <laughs> you know, um, we don't know, you know, we weren't there. Um, you know, the fact that, that there was no trace of the creature, you know, really doesn't mean a whole lot because there's frequently not traces of creatures that we know are there. Right. Uh, so, but it's just, it is a very, very creepy story. Definitely. Um, you talk a little bit about ghost trains, which is also something I've never really looked into <laughs> and how, how in some cases they were, they were portents of death in, in a couple of these. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there are, um, you know, there are several ghost train stories in the book. Like, like I keep saying, if you're interested in anything in the paranormal, there's a good chance there's a story about it in the book somewhere. <laughs> um, I've got ghost trains. I got phantom ships. You know, I got yep. fairies. You name yep. it, it's in there. Shadow people, um, everything. This was kind of my. Uh, this was kind of my my. You know, uh, uh, Frank Edwards Compendium of Canada. <laughs> but um, so there are a lot of, of, of good um, ghost train stories. But I guess probably my favorite comes from Nova Scotia, um, and. Uh, it's uh, the Phantom Train of Cape Breton Island, which is one of the islands that comprises Nova Scotia. Um, there were people who lived in, on a certain hill, um, and I'm not sure how this is pronounced, Barachoy, Bar- Barachoy uh, Cape Breton, um, that saw this phantom train, um, and it would glide by without making any sound at all um, and come to a stop at a gate uh, leading to one of the houses. Uh, and everybody was mystified by this thing. And you could stand up on the hill and watch this phantom train making its rounds. But if you tried to go down close to the to the to where the apparition would appear, you know, everybody would be like, "No, well, okay, well, it didn't come." But the people up on the hill would still see it. So if you got too close to it, you couldn't actually see it. Yeah. The people that that did see it described it as being lighted, but they couldn't see people in it. Um, and it appeared at seven o'clock every evening for a whole month. Um, the interesting thing was that the month was, if I recall, was December, <laughs> uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But at the end of the month, and this is where the death port and thing comes in, a man was killed by a train at the exact location where this phantom train stopped every night for the month preceding it. Yeah. 
And once that happened, nobody saw it uh, again, which leads you to some really interesting conjectures about, okay, was the train coming by to pick this dude up? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because we have stories in, uh, you know, in Europe of, of phantom carriages showing up to pick up people when they die. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's there's the whole, uh, you know, there's that that whole, uh, you know, thing that Josh goes on about in, in uh, Ecology of Souls about uh, the, the, uh, the wild hunt and, you know, the souls being picked up by the, um, you know, by the horsemen and, and taken off. Yeah. So it's not a completely unknown idea. Uh, but it's really interesting that this happens in December because December, of course, longest nights of the year. It is, uh, you know, particularly in Celtic lore, that period from Samhain or Halloween to the winter solstice is, you know, considered to be one of the times when the dead could walk the earth with more ease. Um, so it's interesting that this train is is bebopping around on December evenings for a whole month and then disappears once this individual passes on. Um, I, I thought that was a, an interesting and, and fun ghost story. Yeah. And, and, uh, and obviously connected. I mean, what would the chances be that the thing just happened to stop where he died, but also stopped when he died? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it, it completely ceased as opposed to the phantom train of Wellington, which made its first appearance in December of 1885 uh, outside the village of well Wellington, which is on Prince Edward Island, which is another one of those little Atlantic Island uh, provinces. Um, this train is an ongoing apparition um, and is not apparently a death portent, although there is death tied up in it. Oh, Okay, I was wrong about the other train. That that one wasn't on a December. On a December, uh, it's the Phantom Train of Wellington that was actually oh, okay. on December. But same, 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 same. Yeah. Um, in this particular case, the first time this apparition is seen is when a group of villagers had come together. They were celebrating a wedding, and then oddly enough, uh, they decided that they were going to remain uh, to have a wake for a young man who had drowned. Um, so there was no train scheduled to pull into the station at this point in time, but the villagers are all looking and seeing they hear a train whistle and, uh, they see the bright beams of a, of a headlight, um, as this, which apparently illuminated the entire front of the building where they were having this, uh, having this little, uh, party. Um, they all testified to seeing the train pull up and then just pull away and vanish, uh, but here's the interesting thing. As they're watching the train, as it stops, they see passengers boarding. Mm. And then it pulls away and vanishes. So, again, the Phantom Train, this is where the December evenings thing comes in. Uh, it's seen most commonly in December, um, which, again, is a time when the dead are said to walk the walk the earth. Right. And you know, their the first sighting was at a wake, and then you have these passengers boarding. Again, you wonder if you know the train's not stopping by to pick people up periodically that have passed on. Uh, you know, over the course of time, uh, over the course of uh, of the year, uh, much like what's said to happen with the wild hunt, where you know those people who haven't passed on are picked up and taken on to wherever it is they're supposed to go. Uh, so it, it's a it's a, again interesting, fun, creepy story, uh, which you know sounds like it could come from you know European folklore, um, and again those areas, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and so forth, were heavily settled by the Scots. Um, so and they bought a lot of their legends with them. There are phantom black dog stories from up there as well. So. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the uh, other stories I really like here that has to do with the Fae was the one of uh, that, that Linda Godfrey talks about in Monsters Among Us of uh, broadcaster Christian Page. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so this happened in Quebec, if I recall. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep, you're right. It, it, was in, it was in Quebec. I'm pretty sure it got you, it. No, it, it was. <laughs> Um, so Christian Page ended up being a broadcaster, but when he was a young man, he was living in uh, rural Quebec, Quebec apparently. Um, and he tells a story of, uh, you know, walking along the roadside. He sees a, um, 
he sees a car coming and it's progressing at a very rapid rate of, of, of speed. And um, he's pretty convinced that he's going to die because <laughs> um, he's there's no place for him to go, apparently, or it's coming too fast for him to get out of the way. It's, it's not super clear. But um, so he suddenly finds himself being levitated into the air. Yeah. And, and the, the, the car passes underneath him. And then he starts to descend back toward the ground. But before his feet hit the ground, whatever it is that's picked him up starts to carry him off. And to make this even more interesting, as he's being carried off, he hears two voices, both of them speaking in French. Um, he can't see anything, but he refers to his, his quote-unquote abductors as the dwarves. So they must not have been very tall. He hears them arguing, and, and and one of them is saying, oh, no, no, we should just scare him good. And the other one is saying, no, no, we should kill him. Um, and of course, <laughs> as it so often happens in these experiences, he is completely paralyzed. He cannot move at all, um, except maybe his eyes, right? So, you know, he can't even open his mouth to defend himself and say, hey, I'm a good guy. You shouldn't kill me. You should just scare me. I'll, I, I promise I won't say anything about this. <laughs> You know, he's, he's helpless and, you know, terrified. Eventually, though, the, the side that is arguing for just scaring him wins out. And all of a sudden, whatever it is, just drops him. You know, he gets dropped in the middle of a cornfield. Yeah. And as, as you might imagine, he gets up and runs home as fast as he can. <laughs> and I imagine he probably locked his doors that night, too. <laughs> Um, you have to wonder, so what, a, you got to wonder what's scarier, the car car coming at you at high speed or being carried away, saved, but then, you know, that whole thing playing out. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, well, I've been saved, but now these people are trying to decide whether they're going to kill me or not. <laughs> uh, and I'm completely helpless, and if they wanted to kill me, they could. Uh, that just, yeah, I... I thought that was a, a really interesting story. And, you know, again, that's one of those ones that, you know, it depends on what flavor you put on it. Um, right. You know, of course, the, the ufologists would be, oh, well, it was an alien abduction. You know, well, why <laughs> yeah. would the aliens be talking about killing this poor guy? <laughs> Yeah, it, they it, normally just take you somewhere and, and do things to you. It, it would. It almost feels like theater, you know, like. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, oh, well, we're going to. And again, you know, this is. Another example of that paranormal initiatic experience that, that we were talking about before the show. Yeah. You know, where, you know, you, you have to know that this experience opened him up to, um, uh, to, to overcoming the Western scientific materialist worldview. Right. Um, you know, because there's no way you can explain that. Um, but it is a whole lot like whatever intelligence is behind this weirdness decided, well, okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, let's do it this way this time. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you could, if you were, uh, you know, like I said, if you're a ufologist, you know, the aliens are abducting this poor kid and, and for some reason they decide not to take him. Um, you know, if you're a, more of a fairy folklorist, this is just classic fairy abduction, right? Right. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's exactly the way Things are described in the folklore. Um, I I tend toward the fairy side myself, but you know, I, I mean, I'm I'm willing to accept either either point of view. Um, but it seems like there's something even weirder going on here because you know, unlike the classic stories, whether you're talking about UFOs or talking about fairies, they don't take him any place. Yeah. They drop him in the middle of a field. <laughs> That's it. You know, he goes home, um, you know, and, and I guess the ufologists would argue that he just, you know, ended up missing time and, and you know, isn't able to recover the experience or whatever. But I don't think we need to read anything into his experience. It's weird enough by itself. It, it, it also know? seems and, like it seems like the things were almost just like messing with him. Like, OK, let's save him. Yeah. Now, now let's mess with yeah. him a little bit. Oh, now maybe we should scare him. him. Maybe we should kill him. And then they just let yeah. him go and they don't do either. <laughs> Yeah, it's like as you said, it's it's very much strikes you as theater. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's there's this play acting going on, and uh, you know, it it all seems designed to to put this this young man in a 
you know, initiatic experiences are supposed to be terrifying. You know, one of the one of the, or at least frightening. Uh, you know, one of the things that that is often, um, you know, whether you're talking about Masonic initiations or you're talking about uh, initiations in, a, in in the occult or esoteric, uh, you know, there frequently uh, are uh, imitations of the passage of death. Yeah, you know, which is of course the thing that scares the crap out of all of us. Um, so you know, this experience seemed designed to bring him into, you know, that state of fearfulness, um, which would then be resolved by or, or help to be resolved by his acceptance that there's something more in the world than just, you know, the the uh, the the five senses. Yeah. Yeah. You also have stories in here about I think there were two uh, of Faye putting trees in a path of someone, mm -hmm. which I've not heard yeah, of before. So, yeah. Uh, that's a, a very unique, um, uh, it's a very unique, uh, thing that I found in, uh, the fairy lore of Newfoundland. Again, another place that was settled by, uh, you know, Scottish settlers and, and other people from, from Northern Europe who have a strong fairy tradition, uh, in and of themselves. But one of the interesting things about this lore, and, and I have to give a, a call out here, um, the, the stories, uh, for the Newfoundland section come from, it's actually somebody's dissertation. Um, Dr. Barbara Rieti, uh wrote a book, which was her basically her PhD dissertation in folklore called Strange Terrain, the Fairy, lore, Fairy World in Newfoundland, which is highly recommended. Mm. Uh, it's, it, it, it's not as dry as you would think a, a dissertation should be because it's chock full of just really interesting fairy stories. Um, but one of the things that I found fascinating about this, uh, about these uh, fairy stories, was this idea that rather than uh, the whole concept of being fairy-led, being led off somewhere, uh, the fairies, if they didn't want you to go into a certain place in, in, in Newfoundland, just blocked your way with trees. Um, the first example of that is there's a couple of young women, they're walking home. Uh, you know, they've been vis visiting relatives or going home in the evening and suddenly there's a whole forest of trees where there weren't any <laughs> trees before. Um, and these young ladies promptly returned to the house that they've been visiting and they were like, what the hell? <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and of course, as often happens in these in these stories, there is an older person who's able to give them counsel. Um, they are sprinkled with holy water, which is a uh, one of the uh, the remedies in European lore for uh, or one of the, the ways to avoid being taken by the fairy. Um, and then uh, they were told to take bread in their left hand and throw it around them with their right hand. So they go back to this forest that's not supposed to be there and they do as they're told. And as soon as they make this offering, basically, the trees disappear. Mm. So... <laughs> Um, so they go home, and uh, the uh, the person who who's telling the story, her, her mother, tells them very plainly um, that they should not have taken the northern path because there's fairies that live in the hollow uh, of that road. Said, and you got in their way, um, <laughs> so they had to you, they had to block your passage until they got through themselves. So there's a whole. Uh, as I'm, I'm sure you know from hanging out with Joshua, uh, there's a whole uh, a series of stories about the trooping fae and the fae that move from one place to another, right? Yeah. So it seems like that's what's going on here is these, these fae are, were moving from one place to the other and these people were in the way, so they put a forest there so they couldn't get through until the fae had passed. Um, and it is a very common practice, um, probably still done in some of the um, some of the more out of the way places in the Highlands of Scotland and places like that. It's a common practice to leave offerings for the quote unquote good folk right. uh, as a way of of um, you know uh, keeping the peace with them. Um, and and this this whole business of holding the bread in one hand and throwing it with the other hand seems to be very reminiscent of this idea of making offerings to the good folk. So the other story that's about these trees uh, popping up in places they're not supposed to be has a completely different um, take to it. Uh, the, the, the fellow that's telling the story was telling it about his father. 
his dad was walking along a path that he knew well and suddenly found that he didn't know where he was because he was surrounded by trees of a height that he had never seen before. Yeah. Now, whereas the young ladies ran back to the place where they had been and got, got uh, advice, this guy loses his temper. <laughs> he throws his hat on the ground and starts cussing. Now, if you know anything about fairy lore, again, if you rearrange your clothes, that's one of the ways that you can avoid being taken by the fae. It sort of, you know, seems to to uh, to bollocks their magic in some way or the other. As soon as he threw his hat down and started cussing, he found himself on the, on the unobstructed path that he was used to. <laughs> Uh, but then when he got home, he ended up swearing about how weird this whole thing was. So right. Apparently, the guy was just, you know, one of those people who who was known for his colorful language. <laughs> but, you know, so uh, apparently there are two ways to get the fairy to move the trees. One is to, to give them offerings, and the other one is, is to cuss at them and throw your hat. <laughs> But uh, I just, I found that fascinating. I had not, because I'm fairly conversant with fairy lore from Europe, um, and I'd never run across that before. That idea of the fairy actually blocking your path with trees yeah. so that they could go wherever it was that they wanted to. That's That was just, a, that was a new one on me. And you have a few stories in there about people being fey led and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and it's very much the, the same sort of, um, of story that you'd see in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and probably my favorite example of that one was the, the one from, again, got to give thanks to Lon Strickler and Phantoms and Monsters. It's two young ladies. They are uh, camping out with their family uh, in uh, Butter Pot Provincial Park, uh, which is uh, in Newfoundland. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is why it was included in the Newfoundland Ferry section. But anyway, um, they had arrived with their family. They'd set up camp. You know, they'd done the things that, you know, you needed to do. And uh, so they asked permission to go down to the beach. And parents like, sure, but be back in a couple of hours. So these two sisters take off on the trail down toward the beach. And uh, almost immediately, they experience one of those, uh, one of those Oz effect things. The silence descends on them. You know, it sounds around them are muffled and they have this feeling that they're being watched. You know, when you start this story off, you think, hmm, they're going to run into a Sasquatch because, you know, you got that whole being watched thing. And then, you know, I wish that I had found this story previously because this one could have gone in Mysteries in the Mist. Uh, the weather changed abruptly from being very clear to foggy. Um, fog is a liminal space. It's not rain and it's not clear. <laughs> so you're already in between. And by the time they got down to the beach, the, the, uh, the sea was pretty much socked in. You couldn't see much of anything. And, you know, the whole feeling of this experience was of being closed in because you've got the forest overhead. You've got this dense fog. And then to make matters worse, they run into this guy on the beach who's standing and just looking out over the water. Now, it's the 80s. The older sister says hello to the guy and gets no, no reply. And after they stood there for a couple of minutes, they decided maybe we'll leave and go back to camp. And this is where things get really weird for them because, you know, the, the witness doesn't really remember leaving the beach Mm. So you've got that sort of element of missing time. Uh, the next thing they know, they're on a, a, a dirt road, um, which is not familiar to them. Um, and they and they felt like no time had passed, but the, the witness says that, that she was tired and uh, you know her legs felt like she'd been walking for a long time. Uh, and the sun was pretty low in the sky, which they thought was really weird because they felt like they hadn't been gone for but an hour. So they're, uh, they keep walking down this dirt road, and eventually they come to a place that the older sister recognizes, and they take off in the appropriate direction. And about 45 minutes later, they end up back in camp. And their parents are frantic. They thought they'd been gone less than an hour, maybe two hours. They had been gone for five hours. Right. Um, the mother had gone looking for these two, had gone up and down the trail several times. There was no way that her daughters could have gotten off of that beach, uh, you know, without going up that trail and still be intact because the whole area was steep, thick woods. And, you know, I mean, if you've ever spent any time in steep, thick woods, if you're not appropriately dressed, 
with you know gaiters and and uh, you know thick clothing and so forth, you're going to get scratched up and banged up and dinged up trying to make your way through the woods. Yeah, they were they were fine. They were fine. So, you know, they told them what had their parents what had happened. Apparently, the parents believed them, um, but they were you know one of those people who one of those sets of people that were lucky that they just didn't disappear completely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, cuz it's it you know when you start talking about these fogs particularly I, I, you know we talked about this with mysteries in the mist there's you know any number of of stories in that book about you know people who walked into fogs and ended up someplace else. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So yeah they could have ended up in South America. You know? <laughs> Yeah, it's always South America for some reason. Yeah, you know, I mean, the South Americans end up in Mexico. So, yeah, it's it's just one of those things. But, um, yeah, so this is a really interesting uh, story of, you know, mist and fog and clouds and fairies and all that kind of stuff. As, you know, they went off on a, you know, a, a clear, well-marked trail and ended up on an, in an adventure. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Okay. All right. If you have a story you'd like to share with us for a listener story show, you can email us at stories at where did the road go dot com. You can contact me for anything really show related at contact at where did the road go dot com. If you want to physically mail me something, it's P.O. Box four four four. Ovid, New York, 14521. Uh, if you want to check out my metal show, it's The Last Exit for the Lost. And it can be found at thelastexit.org. It runs a couple times a week and eventually ends up on Mixcloud where you can stream at any time. And there's uh, shows on the site going back to 1996, I believe. Plus live live uh, bands on a fairly regular basis now. All right. Uh, as for, um, you can also pick up merch off wheredotheroadgo.com. It has links to all our uh, different social medias. And, of course, you can become a patron and help us out. You can also help us out by rating us on whatever you're listening to us on and, uh, you know, leaving us a good review. Okay. Uh, as for a recommendation, I'm going yet with yet another podcast. Uh, this one I really, really loved. Uh, it was called King's, I'm sorry, King Falls AM. And it was sort of, uh, started off sort of okay and then really, really kicked into gear and became one of my favorite all-time podcasts. It was absolutely hilarious with a strong paranormal bend, but then it just kind of stops, and it stops because the people who were writing it couldn't agree on where they were going to go with it, I guess, so they just quit, and that's that's really disappointing. They went for a very long time uh, without even stopping from, uh, well, I think they take, finally take a break eventually, but from uh, they started in 2015, And they end in uh, 2019. So there's quite a lot of episodes. There are, let's see, are there even, uh, there are 100 episodes. So, yeah, I think that's it. That's where they ended, 100 episodes. So it's a lot to listen through. It's entertaining. Like I said, it's a little disappointing because it just stops without, you know, like like so many things, uh, it just stops without a resolution. So many TV shows and everything else, and uh, I really wish they had just put something together to finish it off, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. However, well worth your time. It'll entertain you if you like funny paranormal stuff. All right, back to the show. So I'm here with Travis Watson, and uh, we are talking about his book, which is... Canadian Monsters and Mysteries. Um, you have a story in here from Alan Hynek. Ah, uh, yeah. That was from Walkerton. It was a ball of light that was seen in Ontario. Yeah, this one was interesting because, you know, Heineck was a very, you know, kind of no-nonsense kind of dude that had to be pretty much convinced that this whole UFO thing was something besides swamp gas. Right. Um, So the interesting thing about this was that the young man who reported this story to Heineck actually went on to become a professional astronomer. astronomer. So, of course, you know, he remained anonymous because, you know, this is the subject that would have gotten him ridiculed. This sure. was in 1960. Um, so, you know, he, he was not going to share his name and stuff. But he makes a really, really interesting report because he is obviously a very uh, detailed observer. Um, there had been reports of this anomalous light in the area, um, and he went out to check this out. Uh, it had been, as he says, ranging around the countryside. 
Uh, when he saw this light, it was about, uh, it was near a tree. It was about a hundred yards from where he was standing. And he estimated the height, you know, he, he actually included his calculations. I, I, there's like a, a, a diagram in the report, you know, where he's like doing the calculus to figure out how high the thing up <laughs> thing was, which is it's awesome. like 120 feet in the air. Yeah. It's like 120 feet in the air. Um, it was circular in shape, uh, so that he felt that it was probably a sphere. Um, here's another interesting thing. The light was very bright. And it changed colors, and it changed colors through the full spectral range, uh, like changing changing color every couple of seconds. Uh, he had the impression that this thing was under intelligent control uh, because it would it flew around, and it seemed like it would stop and examine a tree, uh, and then it would move on. <laughs> he tried to get a picture, uh, which he wasn't really super successful at doing. Um, and, and as he did this, he climbed the perimeter fence. Um, he and started to approach the tree where this thing was hovering. It's almost as if the light started it seemed to notice him and some other people were coming over the fence with him. The thing takes off noiselessly, he says, noiselessly accelerating at a very high rate, it's headed off to the south and uh, disappeared over the horizon. His estimate was that as fast as this thing was going, it should have broken the sound barrier, but there was no sonic boom. Yeah. Um, so he makes several points about his sighting, uh, you know, but the most important of which is that he didn't just see this himself. There were also several police officers there. And there were also, he notes that this could not have been the light for, you know, because one of the popular things back in the 60s is, oh, well, you saw the planet Venus. Right. You know, if it wasn't swamp gas, it was Venus, right? Uh, he said it couldn't be a distant astronomical body because as he watched it, he saw the light disappear behind a tree and then reappear in front of the tree, blocking out his view of the tree. So whatever it was, was, you know, at Earth level and, uh, you know, it was bebopping around doing whatever it was this anomalous light thing was doing. Um, I find these these spherical lights, these mystery lights, uh, you know, like the brown mountain lights and the the uh, the Marfa lights and those kinds of things, really interesting. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah. You know, because every you know, of course, again, you have the UFO people. Oh, it's UFOs, it's UFO. And then you have you know a, a small cadre of, of fairy fairy people going, oh, it's fairy lights, you know. Yeah. Um, we don't really know what it is, uh, well, you, you gotta but throw, whatever it is, you got to throw intelligent plasma in there too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it could be gin. Yeah. yeah. You know? I mean, these are just you terms know, uh, to describe the same thing, really. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you want to talk about a plasma based life form, you know, it, it's a creature of smokeless fire. There yeah. you go. <laughs> You know, and, and they could very, very much, uh, travel, um, you know, in, in this spheroid shape. You know, uh, I mean, um, you know, uh, Tim and Tim Renner and, and Joshua talk about, uh, Joshua Cutchin talk about uh, these anomalous lights appearing in association with Sasquatch sightings. Yep. Um, you know, and uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's actually a story in their book where one of these lights actually turns into a Sasquatch. I believe so, now, yeah. I could I could be off base with that one. No, I, I, I think you're right. Front, but, but yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it seems to me that these anomalous lights, particularly these kind of spherical lights that pop up in these areas of high strangeness, are maybe the proto form of whatever it is yes. that's going to take place later. Yep. You know, whether it's fairies, whether it's Sasquatch, whether it's, uh, you know, aliens or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like they're, they're a proto form of, of, uh, of the, the, the phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would agree. That's certainly a good possibility. And if something's manifesting here, it might first do so through visible light before it manifests as something else. Yeah, you know, I was listening to, um, oh gosh, what was, oh, I was just listening to Strange Familiars uh, last night, and um, uh, he had Brother Richard on, and he was talking about angels, and there's that whole uh, whole business of angels appearing as, you know, like a, a wavering uh, uh, sort of form in the air, and then, you know, uh, coalescing into a ball of light. Yeah. Uh, as, as their first uh, manifestation. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things about that interview is that Brother Richard talks about how uh, uh, angels, angel is actually a job description yeah. and not actually a being. Really? Um, yeah. 
So I, I thought that was really interesting. It, you know, because the, the 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 name literally means messenger. That's that's what it oh. means. So uh, Angelos d- comes from the Greek for for messenger. So interesting. So that's my that's my angel lore for the night. <laughs> Um, so when we move over to Quebec, there's a really interesting UFO case. Um, this was from, uh, Janet and Colin board. Uh, yeah. So 28 July, 1968 place called St. Stanislaus and I'm it's in French. So I'm translating. <laughs> I don't speak French. Right. Uh, St. Stanislaus de uh, Katka, I guess there are five kids, uh, who observe a sort of circle surrounded by a bright red halo. And so, of course, they go out because they're curious. What is this thing? Um, And this haloed circle lands in a a nearby cornfield. So the kids grab their flashlights. And whenever I read these stories like this, I always wonder, where the hell are the parents? (laughs) Right? (laughs) It's like, yeah, we're going to go out and check out a UFO, Dad. Okay. You know, they're watching TV or something. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> so the five kids go take grab a flashlight they they go out to the to this field and um to this haloed circle ufo thing and they encounter these uh these beings about three and a half feet tall uh ugly black face with rough road skin they're, they're standing about 45 feet away from where these kids are Kids, of course, see these critters and they're like, yikes, and they, they, they all turn tail and run for the house um, and, you know, lock all the windows and doors and so forth. The funny part about this story, though, is that at one point, one of the boys sees one of these creatures looking in through the window and it's knocking on the window, making mooing sounds. Yeah. <laughs> now, okay, I, this is another one of those highly advanced alien technology things that just <laughs> blows the extraterrestrial hypothesis clean out the wall. Why would an alien from a highly advanced technical civilization not be able to translate English or French in this case? Yeah. You know, and why would it be making mooing sound? Yeah. It's, it's com- almost like it's almost like this thing thought that, oh, well, the cows are friendly, so maybe these kids like cows. I'm going to make this moving sound, and maybe they'll come outside. Or, again, it yeah. has that sort of theatrical weirdness to it. Yes, exactly. We're exactly. just going to do absurd so, things. We're going to do this weird thing. It's like the the one story in, in Mysteries of the Mist where the kid looks out the window and sees uh, like these these uh, glowing phosphorescent cows doing yeah. a can can out in oh, the yeah. field. You know, it's like there's no reason for this. There's no logic to this at all. Uh, so of course the group stays firmly inside, um, and shortly after that the UFO ascends into the sky. Uh, they go out to check the landing site later, and there's an area of flattened oats where the kids say this thing was. Um, and like I said, I, I have to wonder where were their parents you know, when all this yeah, was going yeah. on? You know, if there's an alien standing outside your house making mooing sounds, I think you'd want to know about it, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, were the parents out working late in the fields? I, we just don't know, but I just, I got a kick out of that story, making mooing sounds yeah, it's like yeah. of all, the, of all the things, why a mooing sound? And I just picture this entity's head popping up in the window and just being like, moo, moo. And it's like, what? Yeah. What? They were lucky they weren't in, you know, Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Somebody had blown their head off. <laughs> True. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, different reaction, I guess, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's Canada. We don't have as many guns up here. <laughs> right. There was a there was a UFO that uh, hovered over this this um, hotel for a long period of time. This was more recent. Oh, this yes. was in 1990. Uh, 1990. Yeah. This is actually in, on the TV show sightings. Um, and then they had a book too. I didn't the realize they I had a book. Re- yeah. 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 This is actually from the book sightings, but it, it derives from the TV show. Um, yeah. Susan Michaels, I think who was one of the hosts, I think actually wrote the book. Um, this is really interesting because uh, the hotels, it's the Bonaventure hotel. In downtown Montreal, so I mean, huge city, very metropolitan area. You know, there's there's none of this whole. You know, I was driving through the country and I saw this thing. You know, and I was out in the middle of nowhere, kind of thing. This was in the city with multiple multiple witnesses. Uh, 
over the course of time, um, the hotel manager saw this thing. Uh, Montreal Police Director of Operations saw it. There was a constable from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. There were a couple of airline pilots, three newspaper reporters, and several clinical psychologists who'd been attending a convention at the hotel. So, I mean, this thing is, is very well documented, right? Yeah. Um, the first person who sees it is the lifeguard who was at the hotel's rooftop swimming pool and describes just this massive mess. This thing reminded me of, of you know, the, uh, the giant triangle sightings that, that people uh, started having around this time in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, and then on into the 2000s. Uh, says that she saw several very bright yellow lights um, and noted, quote, that thing was over my head <laughs> in every corner of the rooftop that she went to. So she walked around the entire roof of the hotel and the thing was so large that it basically overshadowed that entire area. Uh, but it had the lights, you know, I guess spaced around the, the, the uh, perimeter of, of this thing. So, the lifeguard calls the manager. The manager comes upstairs. And, of course, word of something like this spread like wildfire. So guests started appearing on the roof. Um, the hotel security director contacted the police who showed up. And, you know, and then the, the local police called the RCMP, who are basically the federal police. Uh, they'd be, the RCMP here is kind of, kind of synonymous to the FBI in the U.S. Okay. Uh, except that they handle... Uh, they have, they're a federal police force, but they handle local policing in some areas. It's, oh. it's kind of a strange thing. Um, you know, like in some of the territories where there aren't uh, established towns and stuff, but there are people living there, RCMP will be the, 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 the local law enforcement. Gotcha. So the, the cops that were there, both from Montreal and the RCMP, were all trying to figure out what this thing was. They called the airport uh, to see what aircraft were in the area. Um, they were familiar with the aurora, aurora borealis and, and understood that that's not what they were looking at. They went so far as to contact all the local construction sites in the area and have them shut off their lights um, so that they could be sure that they weren't seeing some kind of a reflection. Uh, this UFO stayed in place for, uh, let's see, the, the initial report was, let me see, uh, doesn't really say. It but was it stayed a, it was in a while. place until it was, it was there for a couple hours. Uh, the, the RCMP officer says that he observed it for two hours and 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so it stayed in place until a little after uh, 10 o'clock uh, in the evening, uh, at which point, here we go again with the mist, fogs, and clouds, right? Heavy snow clouds rolled in and obscured the object. Okay? Yeah. And if you've ever been in you know, a Canadian snowstorm, you can see why it would obscure the object. <laughs> So there were a number of investigations, people trying to figure out what this thing was. You know, they they talked to the uh, the Canadian Weather Service, which is now Environment Canada. Um, the other unusual thing about this uh, sighting is that about the time that this was all happening, you know, just after the craft or whatever it was disappeared from sight, uh, Hydro Quebec reported ro uh, power outages uh, from about uh, 10:40 to about 11 o'clock. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that the line that was affected was a line that ran to a military base. So, yeah. um, you know, and we've seen, you know, those folks who are, are up on their UFO lore know that, that, uh, that UFOs have, have seemed to make a habit of observing, uh, military installations. And they're particularly interested in military installations that have nuclear facilities on site. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's no indication that that was the case here, but um, no, but it's the certainly interesting that, that a military base lost power while this thing was was hovering around. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or shortly after. All right, I think we have time for one more. Uh, let's talk about the <sighs> schools that got slimed. <laughs> yeah. So there's a a um, uh, a um, section at the end of the book that I just called miscellaneous. <laughs> Uh, which is basic Fortiana. It's just like weird stuff that happened. Uh, there's a section in there on fire spooks where the spontaneous fires lit and, th and that sort of thing. Uh, but there's also a section on things that fell from the sky. Um, so in Unexplained Mysteries of the 20th Century, Janet Collin Board tells a story that comes from Burnaby, British Columbia. 
And this happens in 1986. Uh, in Burnaby, uh, a local elementary school had a slime fall three days in a row. Uh, this stuff apparently fell from the sky, splashed down on the building, it splashed down on cars that were parked there. Uh, you know, one of the teacher's aides that, uh, you know, that, that worked there said the stuff smelled like dung. Um, let's see, and a local health official tried to fob the whole thing off as an airliner flushing its holding tanks. Right. Now, Okay. One time I could get, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, it was a random event. One time airliner flushed its tanks and it's lined to elementary school three days in a row though. Yeah. I mean, come on, you know, you have, um, aircraft that have precision targeting, uh, uh, equipment, you know, for dropping bombs and stuff that would probably have trouble hitting the same elementary school three days in a row. Yeah. 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 You know, it's not going to happen by random chance. And if it did, that in and of itself would be anomalous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just because it's, it goes way beyond the chances, you know, the, it happening by chance statistically. Um, and do, so, you do, know, do planes we don't know actually, what it was. It was falling from the sky. Do planes actually dump that stuff? I mean, cause I've heard that they don't. Uh, I actually, I don't. I knew somebody who worked in the airline industry and my, and, but this was quite a while ago. This was when I was in my thirties. So it was 30 some years ago. Um, my understanding was that they had, that the aircraft would land. And one of the things that happened during the changeover when they were cleaning the aircraft out is they would pump out the, the loo, yeah. the, the uh, what do you call that thing? <laughs> the lavatory. Yeah. Uh, they pump the waste out of the lavatory. It's like the same kind of idea that you would get from, uh, you know, pumping out a septic tank. Right, or an RV. Same thing. Yeah, or an RV. Um, so I, I can't imagine why an airliner would be dumping its tanks, uh, flushing its holding tanks, especially over a populated area. Yeah. It's like aircraft fly over vast distances, and they certainly, particularly in Canada, could fly over, you know, any number of places that didn't have any buildings where they could flush holding tanks if they really were of a mind to do that. I don't think that's a thing, really. No. Um, it's just one of those, so, oh, this this has to be the explanation because we don't have anything This else. must be why, because we, we don't know what this is. <laughs> we don't want to know <laughs> because it smells like crap. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's yeah that that's that's just one of many interesting things that fell from the sky in in uh, you know Canadian monsters and mysteries. You'll find a couple of three different stories in the in the the final section of the book that if you're into that kind of stuff, you'll enjoy. <laughs> yeah, the sky falls are always such a weird thing for me. Like yeah, and and they always have that explanation like oh a whirlpool a wind a dust devil or something picked it up, small tornado picked up all these fish, and it's like oh just the fish. So it filtered just out fish. just this particular fish or this particular frog, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, Jerome Clark has one from 1841 Montreal where it rained frogs. Yeah. You know? It's like, okay, not lizards, not fish, just frogs. Yeah, not not the contents of a pond. How does that happen? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a very selective whirlpool. <laughs> exactly. Whirlwind. It's like, oh, I want that frog and only that frog. <laughs> yeah, only that type. And because that's the thing, it'll usually be one specific species of these things. Yeah, exactly. And that's a whole lot of that you know, of frogs coming from one area. Yeah, how did that? You know, the whirlwind must have been bebopping around for a while looking for frogs before it finally <laughs> did the dump, right? Now, granted, I don't have a better uh, explanation. I don't. I don't. I you don't, know, I don't think that's a good explanation. But I don't really know what could cause this stuff. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an anomaly that forms and sucks up frogs and takes them somewhere. I <laughs> I have no idea. You know, I, that's just one of those. That's one of those weird things where I just say, you know, sometimes you got to let the mystery be the mystery. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as what, what what is it in yeah. Mag um, Magnolia? Because they have a frog fall on that, and the kid just says, "This is just one of those things that happens." Yep, yep, exactly. So, all right. So this book is called Canadian Monsters and Mysteries. Okay, this came out when? Uh, last year. Okay, and it's on. It's on. Uh, what? Uh, it's on Amazon. Well, no. What's the book publisher? Uh, oh, oh, Beyond the Fray. Beyond the. Fray. I want to say Into the Fray, but yeah, I knew that wasn't yeah. right. Yeah, Into the Fray is the podcast. Beyond right. the Fray is the publisher. <laughs> uh, 
I'm sure Shannon gets a lot of crap for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may make but, sense um, into the phrase, the podcast. And then she went yeah. to book publishing, which is beyond the fray. I mean, logically it's, it's sound. Yeah. Yeah, it is, but it, it does confuse people. Um, but yeah, it's beyond the fray publishing. It's available on Amazon, both as a, as a Kindle ebook and, um, as a, as a paperback, if you choose to order it that way. Um, as I, I always mention that it's available on Kindle Unlimited if you have that uh, if you have that service. Um, so okay, and you have a new book out that we're going to have you back in a month or so to talk about, which is what Sasquatch Canada. Uh, so I did. Uh, it's called Beyond British Columbia is the subtitle because uh, I have had during the research for this book, uh, Canadian Monsters and Mysteries, I found so much weirdness up here that. I had to uh, pare things down a little bit. So I realized very quickly that I wasn't going to be able to talk about Sasquatch because that would that's a whole, it is a whole book of itself. In fact, it's going to be a couple of books. Oh. Um, I'm working on something else now that's Sasquatch related. Let's, we'll, we'll say it's Sasquatch related. Okay. okay. Um, and then uh, uh, the other thing is was Ghosts and Hauntings. I couldn't really do a lot of that stuff because, again, Canadian ghost lore is just, there's lots of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so Sasquatch Canada just launched uh, at at Christmas time, just just before the end of the year, um, and it is uh, an exploration of Sasquatch encounters in all the provinces of Canada except for British Columbia, because British Columbia again could be a whole book by itself, um, and and it is more frequently mentioned in the Sasquatch lore than the other provinces in Canada. So I wanted to look at, you know, are there Sasquatch encounters somewhere else besides British Columbia? And indeed there are. Um, <laughs> I found a whole whoop ton of them and, uh, and we'll get a chance to discuss those the next time I'm on. Yes. Yes. And, uh, also you have out the, the book on the mist. Well, the other two nonfiction books you have would, my other two nonfiction books are Phantom Black Dogs, uh, Walkers of the Liminal Way, which is about the Phantom Black Dog apparition. The thing to know about that is they don't just appear in the UK, folks. Yeah. There's Phantom Black Dogs in Canada. They're seen in the United States. And there's a whole bunch of Phantom Black Dog lore from South America and Central America. Uh, the second book, my second nonfiction was Mysteries in the Mist, uh, which we've talked about on, on yep. the show. Uh, it's Mist Fog and Clouds in the Paranormal. And it's another one of those compendium books where I went and found a whole bunch of weird stories that had fog in them. Yeah. So, um, and then the two that we've talked about. Okay. And online, people can find you where? Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I have a W.T. Watson author page. Or if you're looking for me personally, I'm Will Watson. Uh, I am also on Twitter at W.T. Watson 2. And I'm on uh, Instagram. And this is the weird one because this is a... a a name that I used before I started writing and stuff. It's Curanair 60. It's C U R U N, like Nancy I R 60. So that's that's where you can find me. All right. Uh, and well, I'm always happy to hear from readers. Awesome. Well, thank thank you for this, and we'll do a, a Patreon segment here uh, and cover a couple other things we didn't get to. Good show. I want to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons. And give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Billuminati, Chuck Shutters, Leanne Cherry, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Indrid Cold, 36 Dingo, CJ, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, Chris, Greg Cicernos, Greg Parmenter, Diane B, MTK, Eric Todd, J, J Otto Bullet, James Lattimore, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linz Jackson K, Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Oli Andre Olar, Patricia W, Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Seed Person One, Stacy Sherwood, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varosh K, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, 
and Ren Collier. Thank you all so very, very much. So there is a Patreon segment to go along with this second part of my conversation with Travis. That will be up for patrons later in the week. And if you uh, want to become a patron and help support Where Did the Road Go, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com and click on the big Patreon link. Of course, the site gives you everything Where Did the Road Go related as well. And I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.